Um, well, yeah, hi everyone. I'm Kristen Pettit, as Ian said. I'm here at University of Michigan in sunny Ann Arbor today. It hasn't been so sunny lately, but today looks beautiful out there. Uh, wish we, we were all together in DC today in person, but at least I'm glad everybody can be here virtually and hope everyone is uh, staying safe and healthy. Uh, I'm planning on talking today about some MPN basics uh, spanning from ET to PV to myelofibrosis. I'm going to focus on treatment options with an emphasis on that word options because we really do have multiple options for most situations these days. And there really isn't a one size fits all treatment plan for most folks with MPNs. So some of what I'm going to talk about is probably going to overlap with some of the other talks today, which I think is okay. Repetition is sometimes key. Um, and please feel free to jump in on the chat or, and if, if it's okay to interrupt me, feel free uh, at any point if there's anything that needs clarification. Uh, so as you may know, the term MPNs really refers to a wide range of disorders. Um, the first kind of way I split these out is those with, uh, with this chromosome abnormality, this BCR able uh, chromosome or Philadelphia chromosome. That diagnosis uh, um, uh, is chronic myeloid leukemia or CML. That's really a totally separate disorder than what we're gonna be talking about for the most part today. Today, we're really focusing on the BCR able negative MPNs, which is most of what we think about when we're talking about essential thrombocytosis, generally manifested by elevated platelets, polycythemia vera or PV, um, uh, with the primary fe feature being elevated uh, hemoglobin or hematocrit, and then myelofibrosis. There are a few other uh, more rare MPNs, chronic neutrophilic leukemia, chronic eosinophilic leukemia, and a variety called MPN unclassifiable. I'm not gonna be focusing on this group so much today, um, but they are out there and you may see some, some about them in the literature as you're looking things up. So we know that the MPNs are caused by, uh, um, by variations in specific genes, by mutations in specific genes. In PV, we see that almost all patients with PV have a mutation in this gene called JAK2 that you've probably heard about. In ET, we see about 50% of patients have mutation in JAK2, about 25% or so in this other gene called CalR or CalReticulin, a small uh, proportion with a mutation in a gene called MIPL, MPL, and then uh, uh, the remaining pr proportion being what we call triple negative or without uh, mutations in those three genes. In myelofibrosis, we see the breakdown is kind of similar to ET. Most patients have mutations in JAK2, with a minority having mutations in CalR, some in MIPL, and occasional triple negative varieties. Um, so we know that MPNs are caused by these mutations. So how do these mutations uh, play out within a cell to cause these diseases? So all three of these mutations converge on one common pathway within the cell. It's called the JAK-SAT signaling pathway. So you can see a jack molecule sits right here it's on the inside of the cell. Um, when we have uh, mutations in JAK2, these are activating mutations. This means that this JAK2 molecule is constantly kind of turned on and signaling through this pathway. I think about this pathway as kind of the thermostat for the bone marrow. So when your body needs more blood cells, JAK-SAT signaling pathway turns on, um, uh, results in proliferation, cell proliferation or production of more blood cells. When you have enough blood cells, this uh, pathway cools down, your bone marrow cools down um, and should slow down on the production of, of blood cells. But the mutations in JAK2 directly result in constant activation of the JAK-SAT signaling pathway. So it's kind of like the thermostat is stuck in the on position and the bone marrow is sort of overheating to, um, to some extent. So that's how the JAK2 mutations work. Similarly, CalR or CalReticulin, when this mutation develops, um, results in a circulating CalR protein that can come and bind to this receptor on the surface of cells that's called MIPL or the thrombopoietin receptor. So either a mutation in this CalR uh, or in MIPL itself can also result in uh, constant active, uh, activation of the JAK-STAT pathway within the cell. When that happens, when this JAK-STAT activation happens, the results in the cell are increased blood cell production without uh, ability to turn off that thermostat. Decreased cell death, so the, the cells don't go through their normal life and death cycle like they're supposed to, and they, they tend to stick around. Um, and in produ increased production of things called pro-inflammatory proteins, or the other name for these are cytokines. 
So how does this uh, manifest in human beings? Um, this is variable. Things that we see commonly are various symptoms, everything ranging from fatigue to um, the, uh, mental health symptoms, depression, anxiety, things like that. Early satiety or feeling full quickly when you eat a meal, that can result in weight loss. Uh, you can also see concentration issues or kind of a brain fog, pruritus or itching of the skin, especially after exposure to water, especially after exposure to hot water, sexual dysfunction, which I believe we'll be hearing about more today, night sweats, bone pain, not talking about necessarily arthritis sorts of joint pain, but pain in the long bones of the legs, arms, hips, back, ribs, those sorts of places. Um, Low-grade fevers or chills, all of these things are part of the constellation of symptoms we can see as a result of the MPN diagnosis. Other things that we can see, increased risk of blood clots can happen. When I say blood clots, I'm talking about blood clots in veins, which can be like a deep vein thrombosis in the leg, cause a, a red, swollen, or painful leg, generally just one leg. Um, they can travel to the lungs and cause pulmonary emboli, which can um, look like shortness of breath, chest pain with a deep breath, those kinds of things. Or these can be blood clots also in arteries, which are more like heart attacks or strokes. Other things that we can see, progressive bone marrow fibrosis or scar tissue building up in the bone marrow, which can result in low blood counts. And a possibility of a movement of the disease towards acute myeloid leukemia or AML, which is uh, a more uh, aggressive disorder. We do see some gender differences across uh, some of the symptoms and disease features uh, in MPNs. We do see that women tend to experience a higher total symptom burden than men when we're looking at all of the symptoms combined. Specifically, when we look at the individual symptoms, women tend to have more abdominal symptoms, abdominal discomfort, headaches, fatigue, and dizziness as opposed to men. Despite this, when we look at overall how, how patients rate their quality of life, women rate their quality of life similar to men despite this increased symptomatology. This is not always, of course, true throughout the board, across the board. These are broad generalizations across um, large studies that have been done. So because these um, disorders manifest in so many different ways, there isn't necessarily a one-size-fits-all approach, approach to treatment. Instead, treatment should really be personalized with all of these different factors in mind. So first thing I keep in mind is symptoms. Which symptoms are bothersome? How bothersome are they? How much are the impact and quality of life? Second thing is the thrombosis risk, or, or sorry, thrombosis meaning blood clots um, for each individual person. So risks of thrombosis uh, include an age greater than 60, having any prior blood clots in your history, cardiovascular risk factors, and the presence of a JAK2 mutation in, in patients with ET also confers increased risk of, of blood clots uh, over mutations and things like CalR. Other things to keep in mind, other medical issues are very important to keep in mind when we're talking about uh, the various different treatment options for ET and PV in particular. Um, and then personal preference should be a big portion of this too. You should real, really feel comfortable with your treatment plan and you should really have a say in, in how your treatment plan is going um, as you develop it along with your doctor. So let's start with one disease at a time. Let's start with ET. These are some of the general treatment basics, some of the cornerstones of management of ET in general. Aspirin is generally a cornerstone of management. So when you say aspirin, we're talking about a baby aspirin. 81 milligrams a day is the standard dose here in the United States. This can help prevent blood clots in, um, in many uh, patients with ET. This may not be necessary even for some, um, some patients with a particularly low risk of these vascular events. So patients who are less than 60 years old, who have never had a blood clot before, don't have any other cardiovascular risk factors like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, anything like that, um, and also who don't have a JAK2 mutation. If all of those features are the case, aspirin may not actually even be necessary, but for the majority of people with AET, aspirin is one of the cornerstones and can actually help improve some of the symptoms related to the disorder as well. Lifestyle modification is key. I'm, uh, I jumped in right at the end of Justin's talk earlier. I'm so sorry I missed most of it. I'm gonna go back and watch it for sure. 
Um, I think living an active lifestyle, uh, exercise, whether it's cardiovascular exercise, yoga, whatever movement works best for you and things to improve your symptoms is really important. Nutrition, I know there's some discussion about that today. Control of all of those cardiovascular risk factors I mentioned to keep risks of heart attacks, strokes, and other blood clots as low as possible. Please consider quitting smoking if you are, especially if you have a diagnosis of MPN, but regardless of any other health history. Um, sleep, I think, is really important, um, particularly for patients with MPNs from both a physical and mental health standpoint. And then lastly, there have, lastly but not least, um, having mental health um, uh, on your mind as well and making sure that that's being addressed and, uh, and dealt with is very important too um, in controlling uh, symptoms related to the disease. Um, the last thing on here is, uh, is cytoreduction. So cytoreduction meaning uh, methods, medications to actually reduce the blood cells. This is not necessary in, uh, in all patients with ET, but we do consider these cytoreduction treatments in those with higher risk of clots. Um, so typically uh, those with uh, age greater than 60 and a JAK2 mutation or people who have ever had a blood clot before in their history. That's one indication to consider cytoreduction. Another if, is if there's very significant symptoms related to the disease and if the quality of life is really uh, impaired by the disorder itself. And the last indication would be if the platelet count is extremely high, like more than a million or more than 1.5 million, then medications might be necessary to get that platelet count down a bit. We do have options for cytoreduction. So this is where some of the options come into play. Our standard first line options, we consider kind of our good plan A's, are hydroxyurea or hydrea and PEG interferon or PEGASIS. I'm gonna come back and talk about both of these things a little bit more in a couple of slides. As far as later line uh, treatment options, after you've tried one or both of these, uh, these first line options, um, anagrolide is an oral medication um, that uh, is decent at decreasing platelet count, uh, but does have many other possible side effects to consider. And then clinical trials is really rising on the list of options of, of things uh, for treatment of PV because we do have better options now and we have a lot of attention, a lot of money, a lot of resources going into uh, developing treatments for ET. So we do have some good options out there in investigation and clinical trials. As far as PV, you'll see this slide looks similar to that one of, of ET with a few changes. In PV, we really do recommend aspirin, uh, baby aspirin, 81 milligrams a day for all patients, um, as long as there's no contraindication like active bleeding or something like that. In addition, we recommend therapeutic phlebotomies, which seems uh, to some when you first hear about it is kind of an archaic sort of treatment. The, the way this works, if you've never seen or heard about a therapeutic phlebotomy, is that if the red blood cells are too high, if there's too many red blood cells, we really just physically remove them, kind of like a blood donation procedure, but unfortunately we can't reuse that blood for donation. We do know that keeping the hematocrit uh, below 45% is a pretty good, very good evidence-based uh, threshold to prevent blood clots and cardiovascular events like heart attacks and strokes. So that goal of 45% is pretty hard and fast uh, across most people who can tolerate those phlebotomies, which I think is most patients. Same lifestyle modifications for patients with PV as compared to ET. And cytoreduction options are very similar as well. So indication for cytoreduction medications in patients with PV include those with higher risk of blood clots. In PV, we define that as really anybody over the age of 60 or anybody who's had a prior blood clot in their history. Um, another indication like ET would be significant symptoms um, that we feel like we really need to intervene on or needing excessive phlebotomies. We're needing phlebotomies every week, every other week, sometimes uh, even every month, but they're starting to bother patients. Uh, if that's the case, in order to keep the hematocrit below that 45% cutoff, then it might be time to consider one of these cytoreduction options. Same first line options as we have for, uh, for ET, including hydroxyurea and PEG interferon. Later line options are a little bit different though. Here we've got the JAK inhibitor ruxolitinib and have various different uh, clinical trial options. So uh, a little bit more about hydroxyurea and PEG interferon in ET and PV. 
Um, both are good plan A's, uh, but they're both very different. Um, so it's worth kind of looking at them side by side. Hydroxyurea is definitely the most commonly used. It works well, it's easy to take. It tends to be very safe and tolerable for most people. Um, it's a pill that you take once or twice per day. There's not necessarily a one size fits all dose for hydrea. It's uh, often kind of a, a tinkering approach depending on what, what dose we need to keep the blood counts under control, keep the symptoms under control and uh, not cause other side effects. Um, a person's individual dose of hydrea often changes over time. Uh, hydri hydroxyurea works by slowing production of blood cells. That includes the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and the platelets all simultaneously, and it's pretty good at doing that. It's generally very well tolerated from a side effect perspective, but there are a few things we watch out for. Most common things are nausea, vomiting, or bloating. If these things do tend to happen, they're they usually happen early on in treatment and usually improve over time. Uh, also, we can see skin or nail changes, generally dry skin or brittle nails that can crack, or you may notice dark lines on your nails, either um, longitudinally or, or across. Um, that's not dangerous. It's just a little different if you not know, don't know to expect it. And some people uh, can get mouth sores or ulcers as well. That usually happens with higher doses of the medication, but everyone's a little different. So let's contrast that to pegylated interferon or Pegasus. So Interferons are naturally occurring substances. They're in your body already. They, they play a, uh, a role in your body's inflammatory response, as well as how your blood cells are produced and how they differentiate. Differentiate meaning how the cells decide what, uh, what mature cells they're eventually gonna grow up and become. Uh, so this, to use this interferon as a medication, um, they uh, obtain interferons uh, from human white blood cells and modify them. The PEG part of PEG interferon makes the drug last longer, so it only has to be given once per week, but the administration is more complicated than hydroxyurea. Interferons are injectable. They have to be given under the skin, similar to an insulin injection, generally around the, the belly button. Um, and the side effects that we expect to see are very different with PEG interferon as opposed to hydria. Peg interferon can cause more flu-like symptoms. So specifically, we see low-grade fevers and chills, fatigue, body aches, et cetera, um, and uh, sometimes see some nausea and vomiting. And um, occasionally, we can also see things like symptoms of depression or anxiety get worse with this medication over time. So that's something we definitely have to consider and watch for. We can usually manage most of these side effects by starting at a very low dose and increasing very gradually. Um, and these, most of these side effects do tend to get better over time, um, but none of these things are particularly fun to go through. So it does make things uh, a little bit more complicated, especially now in the COVID-19 era. If you have a, a kind of viral-like symptoms once a week when you're giving yourself this injection, that can be a little difficult to manage. Um, depending on uh, if you have to go into work, if you have to ask, answer questions like, do you have a fever? Do you have viral-like symptoms? Um, you may screen positive for, for COVID sorts of questions frequently. So these are all considerations right now, in particular, when we're talking to patients about potentially starting PEG interferon. So which is better, hydroxyurea versus pegylated interferon? There's not an easy answer to that. A few groups are trying to answer that through head-to-head -head clinical trials. Um, there's a, uh, the MPN Research Consortium here in North America, um, and as well as this um, called the, uh, the DALIA trial uh, conducted in Denmark are both head-to-head -head trials trying to compare hydroxyurea and pegylated interferon in various groups of subgroups of patients. Um, uh, and so far, the treatments seem to be pretty comparable in terms of their ability to control blood counts, prevent blood clots, and improve patient symptoms. Uh, for those of you who like to see data, here's some data from that MPN Research Consortium 112 study. Um, uh, about 54 patients in the hydroxyurea-treated arm, 52 patients in pegylated and uh, interferon arms. So the patients were randomized to uh, randomly assigned to one of these two treatment arms. You can see the numbers here of complete responses, partial responses, or overall response rate in the patients treated with hydroxyurea versus pegylated interferon. I hope you can see my, my cursor circling these things here. 
Um, and you can see that the numbers tend to be a little bit higher over on the pegylated in interferon arm as far as the response numbers. But when we do the statistics here, we don't see a, a major st statistical difference as far as um, improvement in response. And one thing that, that was noted in the study is, and in, in other similar studies is that um, there is perhaps an increased in incidence of side effects with pegylated interferon and more patients who need to stop treatment as a result of those side effects. Um, another thing that we have seen consistently in studies over time is possibility for molecular improvement with pegylated interferon that we don't necessarily see with hydroxyurea, meaning seeing the percentage of things like JAK2 mutations decrease over time. Um, that sounds like a, a great thing and something we should be shooting for. However, in reality, we don't really know how that translates in the long run. Will that actually translate to improved outcomes or not? And how much do those, uh, do those tests vary? So that, that's what, um, those are questions that still need to be answered. So how do you and your doctor choose between these two options? for cytoreduction therapy if you have ET or PV. Number of factors should go into the de this decision. As I mentioned before, personal preference is a big one. Does the idea of needles completely freak you out? If so, PEG interferon is probably not the treatment option for you. Um, does the possibility of having those viral type symptoms during a pandemic bother you? And how would that work for your lifestyle? Would you have to um, stay home would, uh, from work? Would you uh, have to change activities that you're doing, things like that. Um, also, uh, your other medical issues and possible side effects uh, should certainly come into play. Since interference can potentially worsen anxiety or depression, that's a big one that we should think about. Um, also, if you have an autoimmune condition, uh, interferons might risk flaring those kinds of things. Age may come into play as well. Um, some prefer interferons for younger patients, let's say less than 40 or 50 years old who may be on the medication for many years or even decades, given the possibility that it might be able to decrease those molecular markers after long, long-term use. <clears throat> Is pregnancy on your mind for the future? Uh, if so, interferons are generally thought to be safe in pregnancy, whereas hydroxyurea generally isn't. I know that's gonna be discussed um, further in a, in a talk coming up. Um, cost, hydroxyurea is very inexpensive. While interferons are pricier, although I think insurance coverage is improving for the interferons in my experience recently, at least. And a big question for the future is if there's any features about the disease or the specific mutations in each individual case that might predict which option is better for an individual patient. So what about JAK inhibitors in ET and PV? We know that that JAK-STAT pathway is driving these conditions and we now have targeted therapies to inhibit the JAK pathway. So what role do these, play, these treatments play in ET or PV management? So for ET, JAK inhibitors are not yet approved or standardly used, but there are studies ongoing, specifically this one called the ruxo beat study. So stay tuned about that. Um, for PV, we do have more data and experience and ruxolitinib JAK inhibitor is approved after hydroxyurea, that, after hydroxyurea use. So if you've either had side effects to, with hydroxyurea or have not had an adequate response in symptoms or in blood count, um, then hydroxyurea could potentially be an option, or I'm sorry, then uh, ruxolitinib could potentially be an option. Um, in these settings, uh, trials have shown that ruxolitinib, the JAK inhibitor, can improve blood counts or lessen phlebotomy needs. It can improve symptoms, it can improve splenomegaly, and it can prevent blood clots. So all of these to a decent degree However, we do need to weigh these possible benefits against the possible risks. I'll mention some of the possible risks coming up in a future slide, but just briefly, they include increased risk of infections potentially, increased risk of skin cancers, the non-melanoma skin cancers like basal cell or squamous cells, weight gain, which can be a problem as well when we're talking about cardiovascular risk factors in particular, um, and other side effects. Um, also to note that there's no evidence that Ruxolitinib can improve the um, or prevent the, the chance of disease progression in the long run, unfortunately, right now. So I know you're going to hear more or already did hear more about investigational agents and clinical trials. So I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I just wanted to make sure I mentioned a couple specific things for ET and PV. One is this ROPEG interferon. Um, 
which is a longer, even longer acting interferon that, um, that can be administered once every two weeks, hopefully to improve tolerability even more. This is approved in Europe for PV um, and uh, hopefully will be approved in the US for PV shortly and studies in ET are ongoing. Um, there's a, a medication, a hepcidin mimetic, um, PTG300, which um, has a, a new name now that I will probably butcher, I'm sorry, respertide, um, which uh, impacts iron metabolism um, in the body. And there's an ongoing study in TV. This is currently on an FDA hold um, until we learn more about some findings in, um, in some of the animal models, but that um, may be a potential uh, ongoing trial for the future. LSD1 inhibitor called Vomodemstat that has studies ongoing in both ET and PV, and something called an HDAC inhibitor, Javinostat studies ongoing in PV, and other things called MDM2 inhibitors. There are several of these with studies ongoing in, in PV and MF. So let's move on to myelofibrosis. We can see the treatment algorithm here is a little bit more complicated than in ET or PV and takes into account a number of different factors. First factor that takes into account is the risk group. So with disorders like myelofibrosis, we don't have necessarily stages like a stage one through four, but we have these computer models that can predict the chance of the disease causing problems over time. And those computer models are called the DIPS or the DIPS plus score. DIPS plus is the most commonly used these days. And there's, there's many more scores that incorporate even more factors like genetic mutations into them. Um, so based on this score, we can uh, divide up myelofibrosis into sort of the equivalent of stages or disease risk over time. So low risk, intermediate one risk, and then intermediate two or high risk. When we're talking about the low risk disease groups, um, if patients are asymptomatic within these, um, in this risk group, not a lot of symptoms, feeling well otherwise, it's appropriate for us to watch and wait. Um, for those with basically all other risk group, it's gonna be personalized to the individual things that we see or symptoms that we see in the patient. And those in higher risk groups, um, we do consider things like bone marrow transplants or stem cell transplants early on. If somebody is young, healthy, fit, um, has an appropriate donor, is interested and willing to go forward with a transplant, that is sometimes the first thing we do. Otherwise, um, uh, we take into account all of these other things, including whether there's anemia there, um, whether there are spleen-related symptoms like abdominal pain, weight loss, that early satiety that I mentioned, whether those other constitutional symptoms, fevers, chills, fatigue, weight loss, night sweats, all of those things, and other cytopenias or low blood counts, like low platelet count or low white blood cell count. And we have uh, various different options for all of these different situations. I'm gonna talk about just a couple of them here. Oh, and also um, I should mention too, and I'm sure Dr. Messel will say something similar too, that um, really this algorithm should have clinical trials right up at the top here for just about every circumstance in myelofibrosis these days. Research is moving so fast in, in this disorder and there are so many, I think, promising and exciting new treatments that if there is a clinical trial, available and that sounds um, appropriate for you uh, and sounds like something that is within your goals of your care, I think that's very worthwhile to consider really at any stage of myelofibrosis treatment these days. Um, so uh, JAK inhibitors and myelofibrosis, let's talk about the JAK inhibitors a little bit. So JAKAFI or Ruxolitinib was the first that's approved in 2011. Um, it can reduce the spleen size for patients, it can improve symptoms, and it may help improve the, the length of life as well, um, uh, the actual duration of survival of people with myelofibrosis, which is, um, which is nice to see. I'm going to show uh, a kind of gross picture here. So if you are uh, squeamish in any way, you might want to just turn away for just a quick second. I'll tell you when to turn back. I'm going to show you a picture of some mouse spleens, just to show you an example of how Jacobi Ruxolitinib uh, works in both humans and mice. So the spleens are just mice though. So this is an example of mice spleens. When we give in the lab, we can give mice myelofibrosis and see their spleens um, uh, grow quite large. You can see the ruler next to here, how, how large their spleens have gotten. 
And so that's before treatment. And then this is after treatment with Jacopy. Um, you can see the spleens have shrunk down nicely. This down here is the way that this plays out in humans. This is from the original uh, phase three study called the comfort study in, uh, of ruxolitinib or Jacopy in patients with myelofibrosis. The patients were randomized to receive either a placebo or to receive ruxolitinib. And what we're seeing here is the change in spleen volume over time. So you can see with the placebo, as expected, we didn't see any improvements. If anything, we saw a little bit of worsening. And with Jacopy, we see a pretty nice reduction. These are median changes. So these are basically average changes in the spleen volume over time. So you see average changes of 40% or so over time. And you can look back now if you looked away. Um, so Ruxolitinib or Jacopy does have possible side effects and possible downsides. Although it, it's pretty well tolerated overall, I will say, side effects can be limiting for some. Um, these are some of the adverse events that were observed in patients on the, uh, the phase three clinical trial with ruxolitinib and then with placebo. So you can see there's a lot of adverse events or side effects reported with the placebo as well, which was a, a sugar pill. So um, when we look at those that are specifically attributed um, to the medication to ruxolitinib, the most common things we see, headaches can happen, dizziness can happen, and then low blood counts can certainly happen as well. Anemia does tend to get worse with Jacopy, um, with, with ruxolitinib. Hemoglobin tends to drop by about one and a half points or so over the first couple of months of treatment and then does tend to rise back up over time. Um, thrombocytopenia or low platelet count is very common and can be a limiting feature. And neutropenia, low white blood cells, um, can also be a limitation for some. Other downsides, um, ruxolitinib unfortunately doesn't prevent transformation of the disease to acute myeloid leukemia, AML. And also there's a significant cost uh, associated, sorry, significant cost associated with the medication as well. Um, although most insurance companies will cover this, it's a matter of copays and, um, and potentially applying for copay assistance if copays are very high. Um, and then, so what about fedratinib? So we now have a second generation JAK inhibitor called fedratinib or Enrevic, which is approved in 2019 for higher risk myelofibrosis, approved to be either the first treatment for myelofibrosis or a later treatment um, after ruxolitinib or after other, um, other things have been tried. Um, similar to ruxolitinib, fedratinib may help reduce the spleen size or symptoms. It may actually work even if ruxolitinib hasn't. It has slightly different mechanism, mechanism of action, not just relying on, um, on inhibition of JAK2, but relying on inhibition of other things as well. Um, it may have some impact on bone marrow fibrosis as well. And this, we will see how this plays out over longer term studies. Um, but here's just an example in one particular patient. Um, we're seeing uh, bone marrow here over time. So this is the baseline before treatment was started. Um, what we're looking at here on the top is this is a very cellular bone marrow. You can see here, this is just, this bone marrow is just packed with stuff, packed with cells, whereas there should be some empty space or fat in here. And we see over treatment, we see that this, this um, bone marrow appearance improve. Gradually, we see this, these cells become less packed together we see actually some empty space or fat um, uh, being able to, to fill in here. And this is a much healthier looking marrow down the road. And when we're looking at the bottom here, same time point, same, same individual's bone marrow, these kind of black stringy line things here are the fi fibrosis, the reticulin fibrosis that's forming um, early on in the disease or before treatment. And over time, you see that fibrosis decrease, a lot less of that stringy black stuff, still just a tiny bit here, but then essentially resolves over time in this individual patient. So, um, so more information is needed about that and who will potentially have improvements in fibrosis, um, but, uh, but it is a potential. Side effects with fedratinib that we see a bit different than ruxolitinib. Nausea and diarrhea are the big things, GI side effects even to the point of a possibility of having some vitamin malabsorption, specifically vitamin B1 or thiamine, we sometimes do need to supplement and we definitely need to keep an eye on over time if there's GI side effects. Um, I will just mention as far as clinical trials for myelofibrosis, I won't steal Dr. Mess's thunder, um, but I do just wanna mention, if you haven't been to this clinicaltrials.gov website, this is a great place to search for ongoing clinical trials if you're interested. Um, when, we, when I searched um, uh, just, I just repeated the search, I think yesterday or today, 
when I did this, uh, this search, I found for recruiting, actively recruiting studies, open studies of interventions in myelofibrosis, found 89 studies going on in the United States right now. So myelofibrosis research is moving fast. There are a lot of investigational options available and, um, and uh, definitely feel free to reach out to your physician or to an MPN um, specialist at an academic site if you think you might be interested in something like this. So I wanted to talk about management of a couple specific side effects, just, um, or not side effects, uh, disease features, symptoms, um, uh, if you don't mind. So fatigue is the number one thing. This is the most common symptom we hear about. I think it's the most difficult to manage symptom. Um, if I could wish for one thing, it would be for a, a good treatment for fatigue with these disorders. But, um, but the difficult part is that I think the causes of the fatigue are really multifactorial. There's not one cause. So these inflammatory cytokines coming from the disease itself are a huge cause. Anemia, if there's myelofibrosis, anemia can definitely contribute. Malnutrition, if the spleen is large and if uh, nutritional uh, intake is difficult. Certainly our medications can all cause some degree of fatigue, even if they're trying to treat fatigue. Um, deconditioning or, or gradual um, kind of loss of shape being in shape over time as all of this builds up. And then I think really the strain on mental health contributes to fatigue as well. Medications can sometimes help or sometimes hurt fatigue. Everybody's a little bit different. Lifestyle modifications, I think, are the best things that I've seen to, to combat fatigue, as you've heard about today, nutrition, exercise, sleep habits, all of these things I think can go a long, a long way, not towards getting rid of the fatigue, but at least making it tolerable and being able to live your life through it. Um, treating the anemia, if present in myelofibrosis, I'm not gonna get into today all the different anemia treatments, but there are a variety of different things that we can try to improve the anemia. And then big thing, listen to your body, don't neglect your mental health. If something feels different or off, be sure to be talking to somebody about that. A few other specific symptoms, the itching or pruritus. Um, this little picture here, I just thought was a little silly and just makes me feel itchy just looking at it. Um, so uh, ways to combat the itching and pruritus with these dis disorders. Um, cold showers can help, just cold water or minimizing water exposure for some people. Cold compresses after hot water exposure or after heat exposure. Cold lotion, I have a number of patients uh, with PV specifically that have significant itching who keep bottles of lotion in the refrigerator and pull it out after a hot shower and lotion up and, and say that that helps. Patting dry as opposed to rubbing dry can help. Keeping skin moisturized. Aspirin, uh, our daily aspirin recommendation can actually help a little bit with itching, decreasing the prostaglandin uh, um, secretion. Antihistamines like Benadryl, Zyrtec, those kinds of things can help a little bit for some people. Hydroxyurea or interferons, our cytoreductive therapy can help some. JAK inhibitors are actually pretty good for improving the pruritus. And uh, also SSRIs can sometimes kill two birds with one stone or multiple birds with one stone with these disorders. So things like paroxetine or Paxil or fluoxetine um, some of these SSRIs, some of these, some of these itching side effects are serotonin mediated, and some of these SSRIs can help um, modulate that, as well as potentially help improve symptoms of uh, anxiety and depression that could certainly happen with these disorders. And then lastly, our dermatologists will occasionally help us out with UV therapy, um, a specific type of UV therapy for very severe pruritus symptoms. Um, I've had some, uh, some patients anecdotally with some very good and very long lasting uh, impacts with that sort of thing. So it's, it's generally the lowest thing, the last thing on my list, um, but for refractory itching, um, we, we do have a number of different options. For splenomegaly, let's say the spleen has gotten large um, uh, and is causing significant symptoms. We've got a variety of things we can do. The JAK inhibitors I've already talked about, investigational medications, clinical trials, there's a number of things out there. If those aren't sufficient, um, we can add in things like hydroxyurea or interferons to help with that. Um, sometimes a JAK inhibitor holiday and then re-challenging, so trying to remove the drug um, uh, for a brief period of time and then re-challenging can sometimes work, sometimes kind of resensitize the, the, the JAK inhibitor. Um, people often ask, why can't you just take out my spleen or radiate the spleen? And, and we do that sometimes. As, uh, um, for very refractory cases where nothing else has worked. 
But I will say the spleen is not the problem uh, for the most part in MPN. The spleen is kind of an innocent, innocent bystander. It's, it's trying to help by make, making blood cells and sometimes doing more harm than good though. But removing the spleen is, or irradiating the spleen is not gonna fix the disease itself. It's sometimes necessary if the spleen is, is really causing major problems, um, but often does more harm than good because some of the blood cells that are being produced are actually being produced by the spleen remove this plane, we can sometimes see transient improvements and improvements in some symptoms, but it generally um, can cause more, more issues down the road. So in summary, I think I'm at ooh, I'm one o'clock. Okay, so in summary, um, uh, MPNs are widely variable across individuals. The management should really be personalized to your specific situation. What you as a patient can do, um, identify the symptoms that are most bothersome to you. I think journaling can help a lot kind of focus your mind on day to day what are the most symptoms what are the symptoms that are the most bothersome to you because on any given day when you come in to see the doctor one thing might be bothering you but that may not be the thing that's been bothering you for the last several weeks or several weeks or several months the most um, advocate for yourself or enlist somebody else to help advocate for you um, make sure that your concerns are being heard and addressed as best as possible that goes for really any medical condition um, control the things you can control, lifestyle modifications. I know it's easy, easier said than done, but they can go a long way. I do think it's important to consult with an MPN specialist. Obviously I'm biased, but um, things are moving very fast in this area. So I think it's important to stay on top of uh, new evolving information and options for you. And then lastly, there are a lot of new options on the horizon. So I do think the future um, with these disorders is looking brighter and brighter by the day.